with our first hearing, which is with ITS. Joining us this afternoon, we have Mr. Keith Durbin, Chief Information Officer and Director of IT Services, and joining him are Craig, Greg Nicholson and Ms. Margaret Keck. Mr. Durbin, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we truly appreciate the opportunity to be here in person with you today. And as you said, I have Margaret Keck, who is our Assistant Director of Communication and Infrastructure Services, and Mr. Greg Nicholson, our Finance Manager. I also have in the back, uh, showing moral support, John Griffey, Metro's Chief Information Officer, Cindy Person, our Assistant Director for Employee and Account Care, Don Clark, Assistant Director for Business Application Support Services, Rhonda LeMay, Assistant Director for Customer Support Services, and Colleen Herndon, the manager of our new GIS and Data Insights section. And I always have to give credit to those on the Metro National Network staff who make us all look good tonight as they televise this meeting live on cable, stream it at stream.nashville.gov and on Roku, and we will publish this and other budget meetings to Metro's YouTube channel tomorrow. Danielle Vaughn is in the control room tonight. Thank you, Danielle, we appreciate you. So this is the 13th time I've been in this spot in this room where I've spoken to this body about ITS's budget. And each other of those times, I made the claim that IT and the work that ITS does underpins the successful functioning of the metropolitan government. I'm not gonna say that today because I feel like the last year has made that pretty clear. Many of the business continuity successes Metro departments and agencies have exhibited over the last year, last year plus, are due to the, the team of exceptional ITS staff members who I have the privilege of representing this afternoon. And while you don't necessarily see us, ITS staff was behind the scenes after the tornado ITS staff repaired and rerouted Metro's damaged network to keep first responders online, and our GIS team provided tools to visualize and understand what the extent of the damage due to that awful storm. Five months ago today, on Christmas morning, when Metro lost all desk and mobile phones, our 800 megahertz public safety radio team kept those same first responders in contact with one another, while others of our team circulated Verizon phones across the county to keep business running. And we made sure that as AT&T services came back up over coming days and weeks, that our 235 Metro facilities that were taken offline, that the systems and services in those locations came back successfully. And when we were all forced into our homes due to COVID, ITS was really pleased to have implemented the core remote work, remote legislation and transparency tools. First there was, as Director Monique Odom put it, the infamous WebEx system that, love it or hate it, provided the ability for staff to work remotely and boards and commissions to conduct their business thanks to the governor's executive order. Since July 1st of this fiscal year, a couple of statistics, we've had a total of 41,451 WebEx meetings, 938 of those are Metro Board and Commission meetings, for a total number of minutes of 2.25 million minutes with 217,000 total participants in those meetings. Metro National Network also went from televising a pretty small number of boarding commissions to a really large number of them, and also helped set the records for the mo most mayor's press releases at 101, and we were there to televise each one of them. And our tele te telephony team devised one of the country's first remote call-in features for public meetings, which debuted at a planning commission meeting on April 9th, 2020, which allowed the public to fully participate in public meetings like planning and Metro Council through their phones, allowing their voices to be heard. And finally, unique to this body, in October 2020, we'd transitioned um, to Granite, actually 2019, we'd transitioned to Granicus Legistar for your legislative management and voting. Using this system, after a few hiccups trying to make remote 
voting work, the vice mayor was able to successfully conduct meetings via WebEx and the clerk to manage those processes. And while all of this was going on, ITS was not a department that sent people home to sit with nothing to do. Rather, fully 75% of the ITS department worked remotely on a daily basis. This was an easy transition for us, considering we'd had a remote work policy for years and knew people could and would thrive in it. To list a few of the projects that ITS staff worked on in association with our department and agency customers, ITS designed, implemented, and runs the communications technologies that allow MMPD body cameras footage to be offloaded from the cameras onto the servers. Next, throughout the last year, ITS has supported the Hub Nashville team run by the exceptional Aaron Williams that when new request types were needed. This allowed the public to use the existing public interface platforms of Hub Portal, mobile app, and 311 to connect departments with citizens in response to the latest emergency situation where help was needed. Next, ITS is and has been working closely with Faye DeMassimo and the team on preparing for implementation of the mayor's transportation plan by actively planning for fiber and smart technologies along the identified key corridors. Next, we work with Dr. Kroom and the Metro Action Commission staff to create the HOPE Fund grant process using our Hub Nashville infrastructure. Through that process, $22 million of federal money will help Davidson County residents with utility and rent payments due to COVID loss of income, with potential of millions of more dollars to support those same needs. And really in brief, other projects include working with general services and others on Metro building projects, implementing Microsoft Office 365 across the general government, preparing for an all new Nashville.gov coming this fall, creating an enterprise wide implementation of our Esri geographical information system and beginning coordination with Scott Potter and the steering committee on the reworking of our city works permitting licensing land and asset management ecosystem. And this is on top of the day-to-day -day work to fixing broken laptops, securing firewalls from the bad guys, resetting forgotten passwords, and making sure that Director Crumbo's ledgers balance in R12. So to all of you ITS staff members, thank you for the work that you've done to support Metro's departments and agencies during this unprecedented year. Finally, I also want to express thanks to Mayor Cooper and Chief Operating Officer Christopher Wilson. Kristen Wilson, how did I do that? She's my boss. For this year's budget process. During the process, the Mayor's office took time to listen to the issues that impact our department as we seek to serve our customers. They have listened and understood the IT needs of Metro, not only in their proposed operating budget, but in 4% and capital budgets as well. It is truly appreciated. Thus, with regard to the mayor's proposed operating budget, we are pleased with it as it, as it will allow ITS to continue to support both existing services and also extend critical services necessary for operations of government in the 2020s. So, Madam Chair, thank you again for your time today. Hold on. Councilman Young. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director Durbin. Um, I want to admit something I'm guilty of, and I think probably most of us on council, probably most uh, Metro employees that use any sort of technology, um, and that is when we're having some sort of issue, it's really easy to be, oh, that dead gum ITS department, they don't know what they're doing because I can't get locked into this computer or it's not doing this. And so I want to make sure that on behalf of the council that your employees, especially your support staff, know how critical and thankful they are, how critical they are and thankful the council is. Um, it is easy for us to be venting when things aren't going right, especially if we're having, uh, as we've had in the last 12 months, our online meetings on WebEx that last for hours and hours and hours and probably pushing the envelope of what some of those applications are built for. Mm -hmm. um, and it's 
easy for us to vent and be upset. And so thank you and your team, um, especially the ones we don't see, because I'm sure they're the ones working uh, the hardest, no offense. Um, but I also I mean, just before walking in this meeting today, I uh, was on the phone with Ms. Hayes in the council office uh, because I had an issue with my Metro laptop and tomorrow it's getting picked up and it's gonna be handled and that is the efficiency at, at how your department operates. And so I think it's worth putting on the table that I think especially as a country, we're talking about the word infrastructure and what all that entails and what does it mean and it's easy to think of roads and bridges and, and um, you know, sewer lines, but I think the m most overlooked piece of infrastructure that, as you've kind of said, brings all that together and keeps it going is our ITS infrastructure. And so um, I'm, I'm proud of everything that you've talked about your department doing. And uh, I guess my only question would be, um, so this is where we're at. Where do you think are the next steps that we need to go in the realm of ITS in the next few years and investing um, as far as uh, our protecting the safety of our networks and stuff? Because it's, every day there's a new threat, it seems like we hear about. Um, and then you, you, know, you hinted at uh, the transportation plan mm -hmm. and how that's gonna be a very, very technologically driven thing that's going forward. So, I know that's kind of a broad brush I'm throwing at you to paint with, but I guess from where we're at, what are we looking at in the next few years at the type of investment that we're gonna need in, in your department? Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you, Councilman, for those very kind words. And I, I accept on them on behalf of, uh, you know, 150 very, very, very dedicated staff members. And, we, and uh, the people on the ITS staff do it because they have a, a penchant for service. They understand that we're not reporting to some corporate board, but there are people's lives on the line that we're supporting the members of this community. So it means a lot when, when we hear things like that. Um, you know, I feel like that in coming years, there are a couple of things that really stand out for me. And you, you mentioned a couple of them. First off, there will be a continuing and concerted effort to around the information security space. The, 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 we are under constant barrage and constant attack, and so the tools and the staffing we need to help make sure and help or strive to ensure that that any negative consequences are absolutely minimized that is that is of critical critical importance and we've got a great team led by our chief information security officer john griffey right back there um, who, um, who 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 works with departments and agencies on their plans and their policies and their technology so we can all all keep our information uh, as safe as we possibly can. We actually, John and I actually had lunch with the brand new uh, CTO and Chief Information Security Officer from NES today, and we were talking about ways that we can work together even with an authority that's relatively remote from, from Metro General Government. Um, secondly, uh, and you mentioned this one as well, we are putting a lot of focus bec uh, around um, the mayor's transportation plan, um, not only from the standpoint of making sure that those identified corridors and those identified projects have the the technology to get them up and running in the short term but also to make sure they're maintainable for the long term I mentioned fiber you know fiber is a technology with an unlimited future um, and so we are working with departments and agencies like uh, public works and water um, and others and yes um, to to broaden our metro owned infrastructure as much as we can. Um, and, and part of that is also working with uh, the team of the 2B Department of Transportation on the systems they are going to need to be successful in the mission that's been laid out in front of them. So one of the things we're working on, um, the two new uh, Transportation Management Center, we are working on new systems. We actually assisted in currently the Public Works Department hiring um, a new IT 
manager for that organization. Uh, he started on Monday, and I introduced him to my leadership team today. So we're working on multiple angles, um, I feel, to try to put forward um, uh, and, and make um, Faye and the mayor's plan as robust as we possibly can from a technology perspective. And then kind of the third big thing that I think um, that that is, is uh, a piece of this is around um, uh, the renovation I mentioned of the city works permit licensing and land and asset management ecosystem. And I call it an ecosystem because it is a centralized system with integrations and spider-like tentacles into lots of other systems across uh, Metro government. Um, Scott Potter came to me over six months ago and said, we need to do something to help our public get through the processes of licensing and permitting with metro government more effectively. We need to do something about this, and I am ready to lead an effort. Um, so we brought together, together with him as a lead, um, with Lucy Kemp from planning, um, with Bob Herbert as other business uh, sponsors, and me as a technical sponsor, uh, a, a program called the Community Development and Regulatory Space. Um, it is a multi-year, multi-project, multi-funding source program that will look to create a true enterprise level permitting, licensing, land, and, and management system. Um, Director Odom was up here earlier this week, and she was talking about a management system for her organization. That management system is part of that overarching program. It's a big elephant, so we're taking it in chunks, and the first pieces of that are an assessment that, will, um, that an RFP for just closed last week. Um, we will um, do an assessment for 16, 13 departments and agencies and three external authorities who have some sort of touch to the permitting and licensing project. And at the end of the day, we'll be working um, to upgrade city works, to bring parks into a work, um, a, a work order system. Uh, that work order system will have an entree point through the hub as one of those many integrations so that the public, when they need to do something, they'll, they'll, their, their work order will flow um, directly and uh, the, the public member will only see the hub. Again, it's gonna take a lot of years it's going to take some dollars. I'll just say that when we put uh, the current City Works program in place, it went live in 2016. That in and of itself was an over $5 million project that took almost four years. It's a different world today. We think we can potentially do it in a compressed timeline uh, that's not four years, um, but we are um, just at the at the start uh, of that journey. So I'd say that those are kind of the three big things in my mind um, that I think will be coming down the pike. Mr. Durbin, I had a, a, a couple of questions. I was looking at your questionnaire and there is a difference between what you requested for your for this year's budget modification and what you received, and I was trying to reconcile that with what I'm looking at in the budget book, your at a glance page, because that has about 4.9 million dollars worth of changes in your budget. So if you can explain, like, is there are there any particular items that you didn't get funded or did you shift things around? If you can explain to me what the changes are for the fiscal year 22. And I'd like to turn over to finance manager Greg Nicholson <laughs> for a response. Hey, Tom. To that, uh, the bulk of, the bulk of that is in the positions that we asked for and did not receive. Uh, everything below the line we did receive and asked for uh, that we asked for we did receive, but uh, things that were uh, not given were some additional positions on top of the nine, I think nine and a half FTEs that that were given. And which positions were those? If I'm understanding correctly, you're talking about a $4 million discrepancy, I don't think a number of positions is going oh, to fill a $4 million. No, no, I think it was about 400000 okay. yeah. Uh, I can find those positions. I don't know off the top of my head which 
ones that were. And you can get that to yeah. me later right. if you need to. That's fine. You talked about, and I believe I read it or you said it, about uh, difficulty in recruiting. Um, what types of things do you do to recruit for your positions? Are you partnering with local universities? Like, what, what, what steps are you taking? So the IT environment nationally, IT hiring environment nationally is brutal. In Nashville, it may be it's as brutal or if not more brutal with the advent of Amazon, who is at everybody's doorstep. Um, the board of Nashville Technology Council, that's a constant source of conversation. So uh, we do a couple of things. So we use a lot of contract recruiters. So Cindy Maddox sitting right in the back, Cindy Person is our uh, assistant director for employee and account care, and she is one of our... Uh, She's one of our recruiters. She does have relationships with about six universities. She um, sends not only job postings to those universities, to contracting companies, and then does postings as well in order to sp spread the largest web possible to try to find uh, positions. You may have seen, if we're friends on LinkedIn, we've got an, especially a number of our uh, managers are really good that every time they have a position, they put it on LinkedIn, they send an email out, we try to, to broaden the scope of those things. It's just, it's a very, very tough um, hiring environment. I think for the, the public works slash DOT IT manager, it took us about five months mm -hmm. to find somebody qualified for that position. And now that's somebody with some serious skills because it's going to be a complex environment, but that is indicative of most of the positions we have at ITS. We have very few true entry-level positions where you can just go call a school and have, have somebody in their early 20s just out of a job. Most of the roles we have are have serious um, skills requirements, which makes things more difficult, which is why also um, we do a lot of work to try to train internally and to try to develop with, from within, from those entry-level positions. We like to get them on a career path and bring them up within the metro, uh, the metro fold, as it were. Thank you. Councilwoman Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just got a couple of questions. You, you mentioned that you're adding another M and N person just because the number of things being televised has ballooned. Do you do you expect that to stay? I mean, has everybody discovered this is a great new thing and we're going to stay that way, or do you think it'll taper off once we get back? We we are seeing a mix of both in that space. In the WebEx space. It is backing off. So mm -hmm. we saw a serious drop in numbers with the governor's executive order. But on the MNN side, we are maintaining some of the boards and commissions meeting, not all of them, maintaining some of the boards and commission meetings we had. Um, and as well as we have this huge influx of backlog of projects um, that doesn't account for a long-term position, but we do feel like that the level is going to be considerably higher where we were previously. Great. And that team was pretty strapped already, and this really um, has been a stressful year for that group. Well, they've, they've been amazing, and I know people Thank really you. appreciate the, the transparency. And, I, you know, I can't think of all the times when I thought, oh, shoot, I missed that meeting, but I know I can go back and, and see it, which is really handy. Um, are y'all going to be involved at all with software requirements for redistricting? Are y'all providing planning the, the backup they need for that? And Ab Absolutely. So one of the things that we've done over the last two years is we have actively worked with Lucy Kemp um, on an MOU between our organizations where we have run the GIS group in planning for gotcha. them. That ends as of the end of this year with one of the positions you'll see coming over and we are taking full ownership of the Enterprise GIS program. So part of that from the very first conversations with Lucy and George Rooker were about we have a major task coming. This group has always done that. So we have been lockstep every um, 
through every conversation um, and the selection of the tool, how it's going to be used. And Colleen Herndon and her team, Jennifer Higgs, are, are yeah. intimately involved Great. In, in that. Absolutely. Jennifer can do anything. So that's, Jennifer that's is, is amazing. <laughs> she's, she's, she's come up with everything I've asked her to. Um, and will that, will that include the capability for people to... I mean, is there is there these days the capability to say you know draw your own districts? And I mean, I know I'm I am nervous about what's going to happen at the state level, and I know that one of the very few ways we can intervene is is if you send in your own ideas. Um, but who's got the the wherewithal to do that? Will we? So we had a conversation. Colleen and I had a conversation last week, and and. My, my understanding from that conversation is is the planning team is looking at how they want to do that. So I think that would be, a, if, if Lucy has not had her um, hearing yet, I think that would be a better question Great. aimed at SM. her at this point. Okay, yep. we'll do, we'll do. Um, and then one final question on the, on the management system that you're creating long term. I think that's fantastic. Will that process um, involve some stakeholder input at some point along the way? Because... I get a lot of input from those guys, and I the, know they would. <laughs> the CDR program? I think that's. That, absolutely. Okay, so great. one of the things that is baked into the RFP for the assessment is um, what are they going to do to get community great. input? Okay, I think that's absolutely. really important. From, from those stakeholders. Yeah, well, thanks for all y'all do. Your, your your team is so patient. With, and I know it's always operator error when I can't do something, and they, they always r rescue me, which I appreciate. Thank you. Councilwoman Benedict. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for your hard work. We have a whole new vocabulary. I think Miriam Webster changes nouns to verbs pretty often, so let's uh, Zoom soon, right, instead of let's have a Zoom. Oh, right. it's WebEx. So, uh, well, it's WebEx I, I, in this room. Right, right. Well, you know, we'll do it offline. So <laughs> just kidding. So a couple of questions. I'm really concerned about the $3 million of contractual increases. Can you speak to what that means? Why would our contractual, why, why would our contracts increase over time instead of stay the same? So it is standard operating practice in every contract for IT services that, that anybody has is that there are increases year over year. It's just the way the industry works. And, and our procurement team works really hard during those processes. Their procurement process is to get those as low as possible. But one of the things that they can't do is eliminate those year over year increases. So since I've been doing these hearings, we bring a number to this group that is contractual obligations. And the reason it's so big for us is because we hold many, many, many enterprise licenses. So all of the Oracle licensing flows through us. All of the R12 ERP system, all of the Microsoft licensing flows through us. And you take this from huge systems like that all the way down um, to smaller things like the camera system or um, uh, the contract to, to maintain the microphones in this room. They all have those escalations. And so year over year, we have those. We can pr happy to provide um, the list of that for you. The other um, item on that list is um, contractual increases for maintenance and support. And so similarly to software licensing, maintenance and support agreements also have incremental step increases on those. And again, those are two worksheets we're happy to share with you. Um, and they are always, every year, the only thing that I would come and get on my knees for, because if you don't pay Microsoft, we're, we're, we don't have email. We, we don't, don't have Word anymore. So those are kind of always our top, as you see here, the top items on our list. Uh, I guess <clears throat> my question would be, are we getting additional value by spending more money? Or are they just raising prices because they raise prices? That's Council, a tough Council, question. Council I get, member, it's it's uh, um, most of the time. It's a good good comment. Mo most of the time, we're getting the same value. So for Microsoft, it's twofold. So we are getting more. Uh, we, we are getting the same services, but we're getting more licenses. So every year, we true up 
<laughs> licensing, and very rarely do the number of licenses for sure. products go down. Hub Nashville, for instance, I mean, uh, I was talking to Aaron earlier, and they're looking to add a bunch of additional licenses for uh, some department. I can't remember which one. But that that is, as Margaret mentioned, uh, the other factor there. Great. Thanks. More licenses is great. Hopefully that means we're hiring more people to serve more constituents. We need more licenses. My question was, is it just happening as a, a matter of course, or are, is there value there? So thank you for that. Sure. My only other question that I have for you is, what's an appropriate staff for a city of our size? So you know, rather than looking at the amount of IT that you mm -hmm. manage, but rather looking at you know, um, what we serve and what we mm -hmm. do, do we have the right amount of people in place and the right amount of resources? Well, it's, an inter it's a very interesting question. And there are, there are benchmarks, and this is something that I have, you know, talked to my peers over the years about. And today, in preparation for this meeting, I had my executive team go through an exercise. And optimal staffing, and since you've asked others, I'm, I'm willing to answer this too, optimal staffing the way we view it today would be about 46 additional people spread across, so about a third bigger than we are today. And that is over and above the eight and a half, um, nine and a half counting Jennifer Higgs coming over, that, that is in the mayor's proposed budget. Now, we did not ask for those staff members because... Understood. Yep, yep, I know. We'd, we'd love to increase the staff in every department to That's make it. sure our residents, our, our, our constituents, our taxpayers are taken care of. So, you know, I hope from a cybersecurity side that the one FTA, FTE is going to assist in that and make sure that we're protected. I appreciate all that you're doing. As some of my colleagues have said, or probably all of them have said, you guys are doing great work and we need it now more than ever. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Chair. We are at time. I am scanning the room for last minute hands. Uh, Mr. Durbin, does ITS, do you support all of the departments or are there are some departments that have their own like internal ITS department? So we, our standard answer is we do some, some IT service for every one of 60 metro departments and agencies, 60 or so metro departments or agencies. But what the mix is among those departments and agencies varies. For general government, we do a lot. But a lot of larger departments, such as the police department, have their own um, internal IT departments that are focused on line of business applications primarily. Um, um, the judicial system has their own IT department. The um, a sheriff has their own ID department, and there are other examples. Once you get further out into the authorities, they, they, they do as well. But one of the things that we do for everybody in general government, including um, the sheriff, including uh, the judicial system, including MTA, uh, Mr. Bland in the back, is we run the network and we run network security for them. Okay, thank you. Looking once again, seeing no hands, thank you. Uh, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Nicholson, and Ms. Keck for spending your afternoon and answering our questions.